Yeah, I mean, it was a huge propaganda victory for the Germans. It showed that they could repel with ease a British attack. The fact that there were Americans, Canadians, Brits, it was a kind of multi-allied effort. It all added to uh, the propaganda value of the thing. But the Germans put out a, uh, a report, their analysis of what had happened. And the kind of key line was, this was contrary to all military common sense. And I think that's actually got a bad description of it. An excerpt from today's guest has written a book about the failure of a major allied amphibious assault prior to D-Day in World War II. Sunday Times best-selling author Patrick Bishop is here, and I'll speak with him after this break. This is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest spent 25 years as a foreign correspondent covering conflicts around the world. He is the author of two hugely acclaimed books about the Royal Air Force and the Second World War, and is a Sunday Times best-selling author. His latest book is called Operation Jubilee, Dieppe 1942, The Folly and the Sacrifice. And Patrick Bishop joins us now. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. It's an honor. This military operation is known, I know, in Canada very well because I did a World War I film up there. For the British in the summer of 1942, they were getting pressure from the Russians and somewhat from the Americans to press the war forward. Can you expand on that? Sure, yeah. It's a kind of interesting point in the uh, British war because there's a sort of hiatus at this point. Nothing very much is happening in land terms. You've got a war going on in North Africa, which goes backwards and forwards. There isn't a resolution in sight there. There's absolutely no prospect of any major action in Europe because uh, after the calamity of Dunkirk, everything has been concentrated on training prior to the big invasion, which the British want to be uh, sometime in the kind of medium future. And the Americans and the Russians want to have pretty much immediately. That's a very unrealistic aspiration on the part of the Americans. But the British find themselves in a, in a very tricky situation. They've been begging the Americans to come into the war on their side. Uh, but when the, that actually happens, uh, they're now confronted with, uh, although they're feeling tremendous relief, they're also confronted with a new reality, which is that they're now going to have to deal with partners, listen to what they say, take their wishes into account. And as the war progresses and the imbalance in resources becomes clearer and clearer, uh, the actual roles are reversed and it's the British who have to listen to the Americans, not the other way around. At this stage of the war, the, Amer the British still feel confident they can treat the Americans with a certain amount of condescension and tell them, uh, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. You know, we've been fighting a war. The fact they've been losing, <laughs> uh, it just doesn't stop them from uh, dictating uh, their views to the Americans. So, but the fact remains that they've got to do something. You know, they've got to, they've, you've got Joe Stalin in, in Moscow saying, when are you going to open up this second front we've been begging for? They're on their knees uh, at, at the moment. It's kind of beginning of the, of the new campaigning season has begun, everything's going backwards for the Russians, so they need all the help they can get and a diversion in Europe, they hope would actually uh, lessen the pressure the Germans would have to divert forces away from the Eastern Front to confront it. So it's really a very political scenario that, uh, that the British are facing, and I think the Dieppe raid has to be seen primarily as a political slash propaganda effort. I, I got that sense from your book. The Canadians bore the brunt of the casualties in the assault, and they were really the sacrifice, referring to your title in Dieppe. Why did the Canadians play such a major role in the assault? Well, they, the Canadians have been in Britain since uh, the end of 1939. Canadian troops started arriving uh, pretty, pretty much immediately. And uh, they've been sitting there, since then, really, with nothing very much to do, moves to send them to North Africa have been vetoed for political reasons. And so they were doing endless training exercises, getting rather bored and frustrated. I'm not saying there is an argument that says, oh, they were yearning for action. As someone who's been around soldiers a lot, has been in many wars myself, 
soldiers don't yearn for action. I think what they <laughs> want to do is uh, is get the thing over with and go home. So um, I think it was sort of presented in a rather inaccurate, uh, distorted light, the idea that there was a lot of pressure on the British to use the Canadians because they were thirsting to get into the thick of battle. I think there's a certain amount of truth in the claim that their commanders were. So you've got these two uh, Canadian commanders of virtue, pretty much equal seniority, uh, Crera and Norton. And I think they wanted to kind of prove to the Brits that uh, the Canadians were up for it, that their troops were good enough for it. And it's a, it's a continuation of a, of a colonial story and, uh, and a further chapter in the slightly odd relationship between Canada and Britain. In the First World War, the Canadians were a tremendous asset on the Western Front of the British, right. and they were prepared to, to take on tasks which um, were you know, off to us now, look kind of semi-suicidal, the attack on Vimy Ridge, uh, the Battle of Passchendaele, and they suffered terribly. They fought very, very bravely. They were pretty well led. And so they'd already done their bit in the First World War, uh, so you'd imagine that come the Second World War, after an interwar period in which people naturally think, what was that all about? What did we get out of it? Why are we fighting Britain's wars for it? They do actually kind of revert to this rather kind of, you know, father-son attitude towards the, the empire. And once again, their commanders are saying, no, no, our guys are up for it. You know, if you want us to do something, we'll do it. So they are being, the troops are being really pushed forward by their own commanders rather than pushing themselves forward, I would say. It suits the, the Brits because uh, the obvious area to launch the attack on is South East England, it's right opposite the yeah. So they that's where most of the Canadian troops were were stationed at that time under the command of Bernard Montgomery, who at this stage hasn't become the Montgomery we all know and remember, mm -hmm. but he's still just another British Army general, albeit a rather kind of controversial one and rather a good one because he's very good at, at training. He understands the, the importance of training. So he's in at the beginning uh, of the enterprise and he selects the Canadians himself, even though he subsequently didn't. There's a lot of claim and counterclaim in the story because like any disaster, uh, no one wants their fingerprints on it. I say in the book uh, that you know, if, if it had been a victory, it would have been a different matter. And the old story, that the old saying that uh, victory has many fathers, but defeat is an orphan is particularly true in this case. Now, uh, McNaughton, is that the same McNaughton who was Arthur Curry's artillery commander? That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Curry was obviously a huge figure in the First World War. But Nor was a very interesting man. He was a scientist, really, by upbringing and outlook. Uh, and he did bring some new science to the art of, uh, of bombardment in the First World War, which had considerably important effects uh, you know, at... Um, Vimy Ridge and other places like that. So, <clears throat> but you know, it's interesting that someone like that who's, who's an intellectual, he, he's got a, he's distinct, he's distinguished in his own right as a scientist as well as a soldier. And that sort of thing made British high command uneasy. They're, they're, it's basically a cast, the military in Britain, uh, both the Navy and the Army, not so much the Air Force. And so they're not, they're not impressed by the fact that. Uh, McNaughton has other strings to his bow. They see him as a kind of colonial, bit of an upstart. And uh, it's interesting in their own correspondence among themselves that they rather look down on the Canadians. Yeah, I got that from my World War I film that I turned into a book. That uh, They developed the fire and maneuver tactics on, on the Western Front. And the attitude of the British towards the Canadians, even when they pressed the attack in the last hundred days, what was poignant to me was they made them march at the end of the line. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's astonishing the condescension that they, even at this new war they were showing towards Dominion troops, you know, Australians and Canadians. I think they they were a bit more wary of the uh, Australians, but but it's really interesting comparing the attitude towards. Uh, the colonial troops, if we can call them that, well, and the commanders, and the Americans, because even though they're behind the Americans' backs, they're, they're kind of being quite rude about them. To their faces, they're fantastically deferential, fawning on them. <clears throat> and I make a, a little analogy. It's like, you know, they when they come to Britain, when Marshall comes to Britain to discuss with his team, to discuss how 
the war is going to be taken forward. You know, the under British understand perfectly well we really, really, really need these guys. We've got to keep them on site. But um, privately, they're saying they don't know the first thing about how to wage a war. War yet they roll out the red carpet, and I say it's like, you know, the, the maitre d in a fancy hotel. <laughs> And welcoming these vulgar, high-rolling uh, guests, you know, uh, because they're going to be spending the money, but secretly despising them behind it. But that's, that's the, the attitude. <laughs> but it's interesting that it's not so well known in America because uh, I mean, this is the first time American troops take part in battle in Western Europe. Um, so there are there is a contingent of rangers who are trained by uh, the Commando Training Centre in Scotland. Right. And then distributed among some of the units uh, taking part on the assault. And they actually go ashore <clears throat> on the 19th of August and are in the thick of, of several battles. I, I'm th trying to remember the casualty numbers. Weren't seven killed? That's or right, yeah. The first American to die on, in Europe was killed on uh, Yellow Beach. Uh, his name was Ed, Edwin Lucillot. Uh, it's, it's one of those sort of tragedies of when you're... Uh, reporting or, or rather writing about, about these histories, you get this little smudge photograph, some young, you know, handsome guy, but you know virtually nothing about it. It's very, very hard to find out anything about him. Uh, he was just a you know, volunteer who, um, who, who clearly was brave, resourceful. As, as far as we can tell, the guys he came in contact with on the British side brought a lot of him. But, you know, his, his, his life, boom, it's gone, you know, without leaving any real trace. Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. You know, it's it's really uh, a privilege to be involved with a documentary about uh, the USS Franklin. And the Franklin was something that, uh, that I'd always been fascinated by. And then producer Joe Small and producer-director Rob Childs come to me and say, look, uh, how about if you use your dulcet tones to uh, to tell us to tell the Franklin story? So, as I began to look through the story, and as Rob and Joe kept sending me more and more material, uh, this thing was peeling like an onion. I was I was seeing more and more and more of a really really important story in naval history, uh, and one which hasn't been hadn't been told. So, uh, they, you know, they had to uh, throw a two-inch heaving line on me to keep me from charging right down here to the, uh, to the studio and, and helping to put this together. Captain Dale Dye narrates USS Franklin, Auto Restored. Available now on Amazon Prime. In your book, there's some comparison to Passchendaele in World War I, the futility of it. What do you think the factors were that contributed mainly to the, the failure of the operation? Uh, well, it was, it was really a absurdly ambitious plan. The idea that uh, you could throw troops straight at these heavily defended positions and expect them to prevail, even though they were supported by tanks. This is the first time that tanks are used in an amphibious operation. Um, it was absurd, you know, and it was kind of obvious to everyone taking part that the potential for a massacre was there. They had good intelligence from numerous aerial reconnaissance sorties that gave them a pretty good idea of where the guns were and the scale of the defences. Yet, nonetheless, uh, against all kind of military logic, really, they decided on this, this frontal assault. Um, why would they do that? Um, well, I think the the answer is that the political pressures to do something were were great, uh, and then they were they were supplemented by the vanity of the man who really bears most responsibility for the whole operation, which is Lord Louis Mountbatten. He was the commander right. of the uh, of combined operations, which was the organisation that uh, was charged with mounting these cross-channel raids and amphibious operations into occupied uh, Europe. And after the, uh, one has to remember that the, the operation was actually stood down uh, on its first attempt, which was in July 1942, because the weather was atrocious. Everyone was packed in the ships, all ready to go, and then the weather intervened and it was called off. Now, mounting an operation like that is a big event 
Uh, it's very visible. And so the expectation was, you know, this is now over. It's been cancelled for all time because the Germans will surely right. get to learn about it. And if they get to learn about it, they will think, oh, well, they'll probably do it again. Now, Batten was very uh, cast down because he thought this was another vehicle for his march towards glory and, and uh, eternal fame. And so he was the one agitating to get it remounted. And his argument was, well, because the Germans expect us to come, uh, sorry, no, I've got this the wrong way around, they will now uh, think they wouldn't be as mad as to do this again, having done it, attempted it once, called it off, it would be insane for them to come again. So we're going to actually do the counter-logical thing and <clears throat> relaunch the attack. Amazingly, <clears throat> this extraordinary bit of logic was uh, swallowed by Churchill and uh, the chiefs of staff. Like and so off it went. But it, almost. Yeah, but it's, you know, you don't gamble with people's lives like that yeah. uh, on, on a kind of, you know, on, on a sort of reading of the completely sort of fanciful reading of the German mind. And, and Mountbatten tried to paint the failure of the operation in the best possible light, didn't he, after the battle? Yeah, I mean, I think what happens with a disaster on this scale is that it's in everyone's interest to present it in a good light because everyone has bears some risk. Everyone at the higher levels, militarily and politically, bears some responsibility or can be accused of bearing some responsibility. So they all want to say, OK, it might look terrible, but there was actually some higher purpose to it. And as Mountbatten was the one who most fingers will be pointing at, he was the one that, that constructed uh, the argument that uh, this was not just a kind of pointless smash and grab raid on a heavily occupied port. It was uh, a, a, a kind of military experiment, and that the point was to learn lessons about how to launch a cross channel, a, big, a, a large amphibious invasion uh, that, that would then be applied when D Day finally came. Um, and he he said this continuously right from the day of the of the raid really onwards until the last day of his life, and a lot of people have swallowed it. And uh, it's often said, you know, D Day or Dieppe. Of course, that was a preparation for D Day. All the books and articles that came out about it, which you was have some reference to rehearsal for D Day. Yeah. Now, I think if that was true, then there would have been in the orders. The orders are very voluminous. Uh, some reference to how uh, this raid is going to be a learning process, a learning exercise, and that the commanders would be issued with some sort of questionnaires and things like this, which could then be measured afterwards right. to uh, actually quantify uh, the, the lessons learned, the metrics of the whole operation. But there's nothing, there's nothing there at all that, that suggests that this was the case. So my belief is that it was a raid that for all sorts of, and in wartime things go wrong all the time, but in wartime you, you get all these kind of dynamics coming together to create a sort of unstoppable force, some of it uh, political, like I've said, and diplomatic, some of it the egos of the people involved, and some of it just, you know, things reach a certain sort of, point where it's, it's it's easier just to go on than it is to, to pull back. So I think all that's in there. Um, so, it, it, but Mountbatten, being the, the vain man he was, uh, couldn't bear to think that his name would be associated with an utter failure. And I think that's why all his energy uh, and considerable kind of charm, ability to, to get people to see things his way, uh, went into repainting the picture of Dieppe. And didn't he... Uh survey some of the veterans years after the battle to, to for their comments that basically supported his contention that it was a yeah i mean there were, there were several reports were, were written uh, down the years you know they were still writing reports as late as uh, late 1950s and before each one each new kind of account came out he would go around the people who had been his his uh, lieutenants in the organization and say look you know this they're writing a new report uh, as i recall it was like this wasn't it and um <laughs> they all dutifully sort of salute said yes i think perhaps right sir 
the legal memory of that is completely accurate. <laughs> Absolutely. One guy did pipe up and one guy did pipe up session. I, I didn't quite remember that. <laughs> but he was uh, his views were not included in the in the report they put in. <laughs> now the failure of the attack, did it instill increased confidence in the Germans? Yeah, I mean it was a huge propaganda victory for the Germans. Uh, it showed that they could repel with ease a British attack. The fact that there were Americans, Canadians, Brits, it was a kind of multi-allied effort, uh, all added to uh, the propaganda value of the thing. And it also was quite good from their propaganda uh, position vis-a-vis the, the French uh, citizens, the, the French occupied population because they could say look you know your so-called friends uh across the channel look they they, they come to your town they smash it up uh, and then they're utterly defeated and they go away again so much for general de gaulle and all his his sort of pompous utterings from london so it was it was great they loved it and uh they made it as you can imagine they, they absolutely uh made a meal of it uh, right across the occupied territories did uh, hitler have a comment that you can recall after the uh, defeat of the Allied attack? Um, he, I, he, I don't think he's on record as saying anything directly, but the Germans put out a, uh, a report, their analysis of, of what had happened. And the kind of key line was, this was contrary to all uh, military common sense. And I think that's actually got a bad description of it. <clears throat> Are you working on a, another World War II book, or what, what are some of the projects on your, on your plate these days? Uh, well, I'm currently making a documentary about the Falklands War, uh, 40 years on. That's, I know Americans don't remember much about the Falklands War, but it was uh, a big deal for us. Uh, it was a kind of very Second World War type operation when the Falklands Islands, which most Brit- British people didn't know where they were, or indeed that they belonged to Britain were invaded by the Argentinians in the spring of 1940. Sorry, I'm going to get my centuries or decades right. (laughs) 1982. Uh, And we sent a task force, 8,000 miles of Marines, Paras and uh, infantrymen. And by, it was an astonishing feat of arms, we managed to seize Ernest back. I was there myself as a young reporter, so it's um, ringing lots of kind of nostalgic bells for me. Um, looking back, it, you know, it really was a very close run thing. I mean, it's, it was probably the last time we were able to mount an operation of that nature with the resources we have. We've got nothing like the resources to do that now. So it feels like a different Britain. I'm also writing a book. I've just started a book called The Search on a Book about the liberation of Paris, where I'm trying to tell the story of those days in, uh, in August uh, 1944 through the eyes of a sort of dozen, 15 participants from different sides of the story, including some kind of famous people like J.D. Salinger, who was uh, an infantryman with the uh, 4th Infantry Division who uh, went into the city in the, in the first days. Um, but also kind of people no one's ever heard of right. uh, who try and il- illustrate the kind of drama of the thing, lots of symbolism. Getting back to the Falklands War, I'm just curious... Because I, as an American, I did hear about the war. I remember it. I was in college at the time. What was the strategic objective of of the attack? I think that's what uh, Americans may not understand. Yeah, point. well, it wasn't really a strategic objective. And indeed, the army uh, were pretty reluctant to endorse it because their view was, look, you know, it, it doesn't actually mean anything. These islands are right on the other side of the world. They don't have any strategic value in terms of you know, geopolitical value. Uh, there are no resources there. There was believed to be oil, but you know, it was going to be very expensive to lift it, which remains the case today. Yeah. It, was a, it was a war about principle and a war about uh, a war about uh, face. You know, it was about, first of all, defending the principle that the people of, of the Falkland Islands feel themselves to be utterly British if you ever went there, you, you would imagine that they were, they are like Britons who've just been stranded on some very remote islands on the opposite side of the world to Britain itself. Uh, and they have the slightest desire to be absorbed into 
Argentina, despite Argentina's uh, claims that it was Argentinian territory. If you look at the history, it, it, it's very confused. And uh, mm -hmm. really the only thing that you can use to measure the justice of, of ownership is what do the people on the islands actually want? And they, to a man, a woman, a child, they wanted to stay British. So that was a principle that was accepted across the political spectrum in Britain. Even the very, you know, the very leftist Labour opposition leader, who uh, was Nat, was a CND member against uh, nuclear weapons, and generally of a sort of not pacifist but pacific. Bent, uh, he stood up in the House of Commons and said, no, no, we've got to go to war. You know, we can't, this is a sacred principle that can't be violated. But the strategic value, practically nil, which remains the case today, but the symbolic value uh, mm -hmm. and what the signal it would send to the world about Britain's place in the pecking order if we just meekly rolled over and allowed this tin pot dictatorship to, to hold on to the islands, I think was very, very important. I see. The book is called Operation Jubilee, Dieppe 1942, The Folly and the Sacrifice, and I highly recommend it. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. This was very enjoyable. It's a pleasure, Rob. Thanks very much for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be Prit Batar, author of The Reckoning. Hitler had certainly invaded the Soviet Union with the ex very explicit intention of this being a very different sort of war. He explicitly stated that the urban population of the Soviet Union would be regarded as surplus and would simply have to die in order to release sufficient agricultural produce to feed Germany and Central Europe. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, please share the show on social media and follow me on Twitter at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been pointed to spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supported members. We make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, it just takes seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, then complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So to wait, become a member today, and thank you for your support.